Well, good morning and welcome, and it's so good to see you gathered for worship on this wonderful Lord's Day. This is the first Sunday in spring, and as the kids might say, I am here for it. I am so glad spring is here, and we're supposed to have a wonderful week, and there's no better way to start your week than worshiping the Lord together. We'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for worship online. We appreciate you taking your time to worship with us. We do ask one thing of you, if you would just type in where you are and uh, let you uh, are worshiping with us so we would know and be able to respond to you in that way. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it very, very, very much. We have gathered this morning for the worship of God. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand together and greet each other in the name of Christ. You may be seated. I have a handful of announcements for us this morning, and like usual, I'm just going to run straight through them, fast talking and all, and if you need me to repeat any of them after the service, please let me know, and I'd be happy to repeat them for you or even make you a copy of our announcement sheet. Uh, the first one is that this Wednesday night uh, from 6.15 to 7 p.m., we have RBC Kids, and so... We're looking forward to that. Grace is already throwing her hands up for that. It's going to be a good time for that. So RBC Kids is this Wednesday from 6.15 to 7 p.m. across the street at Hattie Column Center. There is a deacons meeting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Center. So if you're a deacon and you are here on Wednesday night, you should be in the Fellowship Center for our deacons meeting at 7 p.m. Our Sunday school class next Sunday is the Koinonia class. Uh, so if you're a member of that class, your Sunday school will be meeting in the Fellowship Center uh, next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Speaking of next Sunday, next Sunday, March 28th, at 11 a.m., the Chancel Choir and the Drama Team will be presenting one day uh, Easter cantata for us. It's going to be during the 11 o'clock worship hour, and I know that they have been hard at work uh, preparing for this, and so the... The, the ooh, excuse me, had a little bit of a stroke there. So the cantata is entitled One Day. Not they're going to have a cantata one day. Somebody talked to me about that last week and I wanted the clarification. It is next Sunday at 11 a.m. So there you go. Uh, our virtual Monday Thursday service is April 1st at 7 p.m. And that'll be streamed live on Facebook Live. And so if you're looking for the Monday Thursday service, It'll be on Facebook Live and then posted on our website and YouTube following the service. Our Easter lilies, we're raising money or we're collecting money for our Easter lilies. Um, Tuesday, March 23rd, which if I'm not mistaken is coming up this Tuesday, is the deadline to place orders for Easter lilies. Now lilies are $15 each. And so if you are looking for purchasing one, two, maybe 20 Easter lilies, uh, just make a note of that. The last day to purchase those is Tuesday, March 23rd. And lastly, uh, the North Carolina Baptist men is still collecting uh, relief funds uh, for the winter events in Texas uh, and the disaster that was there. If you feel led to give towards that, checks should be made payable to the church and noted as NCBM, which is North Carolina Baptist men, dash Texas and just write that on your memo line. And the deadline, the deadline to contribute for that is today. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Oh. 
our moment of meditation this morning, uh, Marsha will be playing, O oh, Jesus, crowned with all renown. So let's open our hearts to listen to the Lord this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious and merciful Savior, we come to you today in a spirit of worship. We come to you in gratitude for all your grace has afforded us, for the power to stand in Christ, for the privilege of forgiveness of sin, for the promise of eternal life, for the fellowship of the Spirit in your community, which will be with us now and forever. In all these things, we give you thanks. We pray that our worship today would honor and glorify the Christ. We pray that his spirit would overwhelm our sorrow and our sin and our shame, and today we would stand fully and fully know the power of grace. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the spirit we pray, amen. If I could have all the children come up for our children's time. Good morning, Ainsley. Good morning, Gracie. No. No. All right, so I wanted to start off with a question this morning. Do you know, I think you guys know the answer to this. I think, Ainsley, even you know the answer to this. Do you know what it means to mock someone? To make fun of them, to call them names. Gracie's like looking to the side. She's avoiding eye contact right now. So mocking is attacking someone with your words, often intimidating them or making fun of them. And so our lesson today is, is honestly a very sad lesson. Jesus has been arrested. He's about to be put on trial like a person who has done something wrong, like a criminal. Now, do you think Jesus was a criminal? No. Do you, did you think he did anything wrong? Mm-mm. Do you think that they would be fair to Jesus? Oh, no, not at all. And so Jesus has just been arrested, and they led him away to the high priest, and all of the important people came together. Now, all of these men kept trying to get someone to accuse Jesus of a crime so they could put him to death, but they were not finding anyone. Many people were making up stories about Jesus, but their stories just didn't match up. So it was clear that they were lying. But Jesus did not defend himself, even though the stories were not true. 
the high priest stood up and questioned Jesus, saying, Why are you not answering? But Jesus kept silent. He didn't answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him, and he said, Are you the Christ? This time Jesus answered and said, I am. This made the high priest very, very angry, and they all condemned him to be deserving of death. That's a pretty sad story this morning, wouldn't you think? Jesus went through so much pain and suffering, and yet he never defended himself. He let them tell lies about him and treat him just like a criminal. They made fun of Jesus, calling him the king of the Jews, though they were making fun of Jesus, who was uh, later that he called the king of the Jews. Later, when Jesus was on the cross, they tell him that if he really was the Messiah, he should be able to save himself. But Jesus chose not to save himself because he wanted to save us instead. Jesus allowed these men to mock him, to spit on him, and to beat him. And he could have stopped them at any time, but he chose to suffer and die so that we could be set free from our sin. And his death is powerful for us this morning. Why don't we say a prayer about that this morning? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your great love for us. You loved us so much so that you gave your son to die on the cross for the bad things that we have done. Thank you for showing us your power by raising him from the dead, giving us a way to live forever with you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing our hymn of praise this morning at Calvary.
reading of scripture this morning comes from that John 19 passage that I spoke about in our children's sermon today. It's verses 1 through 16. I'll be reading them out loud, but you can follow along in your Bibles and also on the screen behind me. Beginning in verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. And when the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again, and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it has been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had what they call an aha moment? One of those moments where all of a sudden everything that had been confusing you or frustrating you came into focus and made perfect sense. Perhaps you were working on a car and you couldn't figure out what was going on wrong with the car and all of a sudden the small detail you overlooked and everything fell into place. Or perhaps it's with homework and you can't understand your math or English assignment and suddenly click. Or perhaps it's with your children and your children, you're, you're struggling with how to parent them, but all of a sudden, click. It just happens. I think that is the way, and that's the reason that much of the gospel is written to us the way it is. If you were to just pull out your Bible and notice how long the story of Holy Week was in comparison to the rest of the story of Jesus' life, you would probably be shocked. There are 16 chapters in the Gospel according to Matthew, and in chapter 11, excuse me, the Gospel according to Mark. So let's try that again. In the Gospel according to Mark, there are 16 chapters. And picking up in chapter 11, you read the story of the triumphal entry. John picks that up in chapter 12. Almost half the gospel, not quite, but about 40 to 45 percent of the gospel story is the events of Holy Week. And I believe that is simply because they, for them, for the original followers of Jesus, it explained everything. Everything about life, everything we needed to know about eternal life, how to live in this life, how to face our end, and how to be raised from the dead. All of those things were answered in the cross of Jesus Christ. Every area of their lives was suddenly unlocked by this event. The cross solves every human problem, even the most intimate of human problems. Problems like guilt and shame. Now, guilt and shame are two similar things, but they have an important difference. Guilt is what we feel when we have done something wrong. Guilt is what we feel about things. Shame is how we feel about ourselves. When we feel like there is something wrong, not with what we've done, but with what who we are, we feel shame. And strangely enough, there are times in our lives where both of those can be a net positive. There are people in this world who feel shame about who they are, about their intellectual powers. And they are what you might call approval addicts. And getting approval from one person is never enough. They need approval from all the people. And so when it comes to school, they do exceptionally well because what they need, they think, is someone to approve of them, to tell them they've done well. It drives them to succeed. And you'll find people who are deeply self-shamed at the highest levels of life. And then what's really funny is despite the fact that they've achieved so much, they don't feel like they've really earned it. They end up with what's called imposter syndrome. It drives them even though it's a negative. Now, some of us, when we feel guilt, guilt might actually make us do the right thing. There was a retired now pastor named Fred, and Fred would tell stories of his life growing up in Tennessee, and Fred was a boy and just a typical little boy. And he and some of his little boy friends noticed there was a blind man in town sitting on the corner begging, holding out a tin cup. And they decided they would get one over on the blind man and they brought some penny nails. And as they walked by the blind man, they dropped the penny nails into his tin cup. Click, 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 click. They went jangling in his cup. And they walked away as he said, thank you. And, you know, it just didn't sit right with Fred what he had done. It's guilt. And that guilt was a good thing. 
because it made Fred go back to the man and say, I'm very sorry for what I've done. The man forgave him. Shame and guilt attack us in all kinds of places in life and all kinds of points in our lives. One person says about shame, just when I start to feel good about myself, shame stabs me like a knife. These are almost all the time destructive instincts in your life. We have seen shame play out on our news this week. Now, if you read press accounts, the shooting in Atlanta had to do with anti-Asian hate. And honestly, there, there may be something to that, I don't know. But if you read what the man who shot the people said, was he had an addiction, he could not control himself, that was an easy place for him to feed his addiction, and he had to end them temptation. He could not deal with his shame anymore. His shame led him to hate himself and hate other people. You're a candidate for shame if you're overly responsible. If you've lived in the shadow of someone else all your life. If you have an inferiority complex. All of these will make you feel shame. The perpetually guilty struggle too. No matter how many times they say they're sorry to the person they've harmed or sorry to the Lord, they can't get over what they've done. It still haunts them. I don't encounter that personality type anymore, or not much anymore. The people I encounter most are people who think, I did it, and it wasn't that bad, and I would probably do it again. And I think they have a shame problem. I think they cannot say it was wrong and I'm sorry, because if they have to say it was wrong, I'm sorry, it affects their person and they feel shame. For both of these, the cross is the healer. The cross of Jesus Christ solves our shame problem. If you've ever watched many of the, the modern portrayals of the crucifixion, like maybe the Passion of the Christ, you will notice how much time is spent in portraying the utter agony and brutality of the crucifixion. That, of course, is true. What is often unportrayed is how deeply shameful it was. Uh, the Roman writer Cicero said the cross was a most cruel and disgusting punishment. It's a crime to put a Roman citizen in chains. It is an enormity to flog one, sheer murder to slay one. What will I say of the crucifixion? It's impossible to find a word for such an abomination. Let the very mention of the cross be removed from the Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, and ears. The cross wasn't just designed to inflict maximum human pain. It was to inflict maximum human shame. The person was completely exposed and left to hang until death. Sometimes that would come quickly, aided by Roman soldiers. Sometimes that would come days later where people could walk by. It was a disgrace. It was reserved for slaves. And the particular thing that got Jesus crucified was, of all things, of all things, they called him a blasphemer. That's what the Jews wanted him dead for. They wanted him to die, and they used the charge of blasphemy. And as if, as if all that wasn't enough, they called him names on the cross. You know, when we were growing up, we had this little slogan, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a bald-faced lie. Some of the most painful instances in all of life are words spoken. And they went to Jesus saying the most hurtful things they could. When Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken him? Me. When Jesus felt at his absolute worst, felt the complete absence of God, they heard Eli and said, e Eli? Oh, he's calling for Elijah. Maybe Elijah will come down and help him. You can hear the sneer 2,000 years later in the written words. If, 
you are really the Messiah. Come down off the cross, save yourself and us too. It was shame. It was the kind of thing that the Romans did to make a point. They put the, his charge, king of the Jews, in multiple languages of, on, above the centerpiece of the cross. And what they were doing was making the king of the Jews so shameful that no one else would ever want to claim him again. They call this deterrence. Jesus endured my shame and your shame. And therefore, in the power of God, he has ended shame. Shame only has power over your life now if you let it. The only power it can has is the power of the secret, and the secret is destroyed because God knows everything. And because God knows everything and has endured your shame, there is nothing, nothing that should shame you ever again. You belong to God. In Christ, we not only experience relief from our shame, we experience forgiveness from our sin. Now, forgiveness, we tend to divorce it from its natural... Uh, where it would grow naturally in other places, where the term would grow, be naturally used. When we bring it into Christian circles, we think about God forgiving us for what we have done through Jesus Christ on the cross, and that's true. But don't forget that forgiveness, the term itself, is a financial term. It is a financial transaction. Sometimes Jesus' parables even allude to this. I want you to imagine you owe a debt. I dare say in this room there are many of you who have had a financial crisis due to debt at one time or another in your life. And perhaps you've gone into bankruptcy or perhaps you've had uh, credit counseling, but debt wore you out. It beat you down. It defeated you utterly and you had to get help. I want you to imagine having so much debt that you did not know when you were going to pay your bills the next time. I want you to imagine what it feels. And many of you don't have to imagine, you just have to remember. And perhaps some of you don't have to remember this is your reality. That you're laying in bed at night and you don't know how you're going to keep the lights on. You're in that much debt. And I want you to imagine that you wake up in the next morning and every last cent you've ever owed has been forgiven. All. That's what the cross does. If you were to think of your sins as a debt, could you pay them back? Most days we think of ourselves as good people, and most days we probably are. But perhaps, perhaps... We sin once a day in something we've done. That's 365 a year. That's 3,000 over a decade. My math's not good enough to say suddenly what 70 times 3,000 would be, but you can roll with it. You know. That's a lot. And that's not counting just the sins that we do, the evil things we knew were evil that we did what about the sins that were more passive in nature, like the bitter attitude you harbor, your unwillingness to forgive your neighbor for whatever, or your unwillingness to be reconciled to someone in your family for whatever reason? These are sinful things, and we hold on to them. If you think of it that way, it is a staggering debt, and you owe it, and you cannot. Jesus Christ in the cross paid it for you. You do not have to live under the fear of sin debt anymore. His name is not important for the moment. He was an artist, and most people thought him a very good one. 
and he had a large, large project he was undertaking that would take him years of his life. He would go up and he would lay on a scaffold with his back down, painting on a ceiling for days and days and days on end. And somehow the image that was in his mind could never actually get to the paper. He, he just couldn't. And every day he would climb down from the scaffolding and he would say, I'm not a painter. And he'd walk out in disgust. The next day, he would climb the scaffolding again and repeat the process. His name was Michelangelo. What he was painting was the Sistine Chapel. The power of the cross means that you do not have to feel ashamed ever again. You can see yourself as everyone else and as the God sees you as a child of God. I read something about guilt and shame that I, I, I wanted to share with you. And this is a postscript for a good life. Some things you can say to yourself about yourself. It will make your life better. I believe that the only self I need to measure up to is the self my maker made me to be. I believe that I am accepted by the grace of God without regard to my deserving. I believe that I am accepted along with my shadows and the mix of good and bad I breed in them. I believe I am worthy to be accepted. I believe that nothing I deserve to be ashamed of will ever make me unacceptable to God. I believe I can forgive anyone who has ever infected me with shame I don't deserve. I believe I can forgive myself for anything that I have ever done to shame myself or another person. I am gratefully proud of being who I am and what I shall be. I believe that the grace of God heals the shame I do not deserve and heals the shame I do. I believe that grace is the best thing in the world. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 8. Who shall lay any charge against God's elect? And the answer, none. Who is it that condemns? There is only one who has the right to condemn you. There is only one. His name is Jesus Christ and he died for you. And so you do not have to be condemned. You do not have to feel condemned. And when the demons of your past or present come back, you can safely ignore them. When guilt strikes, you can say to it, have I asked for forgiveness? And if that answer is yes, you can freely let it go. You do not have to live in guilt anymore. When your need for approval comes, you can let it go. When you're feeling second rate because you've been second fiddle all your life comes, you can let that go too. In the cross, we have everything we need. So when the feelings of guilt come to you, run to the cross. When the feelings of shame come in your life, run to the cross. When the feelings of inferiority come to your life, run to the cross. Because in Christ, you belong to God. He has claimed you as his own. You belong to him. And there is nothing that can ever shake that from being true. Ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, we come to you grateful for the cross. Help us to draw near to the cross and know you and love you. Help us to receive what we need, the healing of our shame, the forgiveness of our guilt, and help us to hold to these our whole life through. For this is the prayer we make in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. An imitation is a very public thing, and that's hard to communicate across the internet. But if the message today is spoken to you or the music is spoken to you and you'd like someone to pray with, look for me on Facebook. You can message me. 
I'll be glad to respond. You can also call me at the church office, or you can text me or email me. I'll be glad to respond to you. As for those of us in this room, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you today, it is time to respond. I'm reminded today of something I learned in some study recently called the eight-second rule. You have eight seconds to decide to do something. Eight. After those eight are gone, your mind will let it go and move on to a different thing. So there is an urgency to what's going on in your heart right now. If the Spirit is speaking to you, it's time to respond. You can do that by coming forward. Or write yourself a note to say, I'll talk to Lane later. Just make sure you do it. If you want to pray with me now, please go out these double doors. I will meet you there. The invitation is Christ. And our, the response is yours as we sing our invitational hymn, Lead Me to Calvary. Let's stand together as we sing. It has been a wonderful day to worship with you, and I trust that the Lord has spoken to you, and I trust that you have encountered his spirit with gladness. Let's bow now and receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.